Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by this amazing AI tool called Visdolia. At the end of this session, I will be posting the practice sessions via Visdolia so that your learning would be much better. In continuation with the autoimmune diseases series, particularly systemic lupus erythematosus, let's talk about clinical features and lab diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus. If you are here for the first time, I would suggest you to watch these videos on SLE where I have talked about the autoantibodies, the etiopathogenesis as well as the morphology of systemic lupus erythematosus. Remember, systemic lupus erythematosus is a multi-system disease and it is very highly variable in its presentation in the sense that it can be as mild as minimal mucocutaneous lesions to severe life-threatening diseases with multi-organ involvement. But then based on these clinical features alone, you cannot make a diagnosis of SLE. So basically, SLE is a constellation of clinical, serologic and morphological changes. Let's see what are the clinical features. Usually, systemic lupus erythematosus is acute or insidious in its onset. Often, the patient is a young woman with some of these following features. It might not be all the features are present in a particular patient. Remember, the constitutional symptoms is one of the most important features, particularly fever and SLE is an infrequent cause of fever of unknown origin. The mucocutaneous manifestations, classically, you know, this is a butterfly-shaped rash over the face involving the cheeks and the nasal bridge. Sometimes the rash can be photos photosensitive. It can be widespread, non-scarring, non indurated non rash. But then, you know, the most common form of cutaneous lupus erythematosus is discoid lupus erythematosus, where the lesions are disc-shaped, erythematous papules are plagues with scaling and central clearing. That's a characteristic of discoid lupus erythematosus. Patients can also have oral and nasal ulcers, photosensitivity as I've mentioned, but then sometimes there can be bullous lesions as well, you know. Patients can manifest with features of urticaria, erythema multiforme and acanthosis nigricans. The next important manifestations are musculoskeletal manifestations, which is referred to as lupus arthritis, where patients often present with pain, but then they do not have deformity. The pain can be in one or more peripheral joints, could be feet, ankles, knees, hips, fingers, wrists, elbows and shoulders. You know, sometimes patients manifest with symptoms of vascular necrosis of hip joints. In around 20% of cases, patients with SLE are prone to develop fibromyalgia. We have discussed in detail about the renal manifestations when I talked about the morphology of SLE, that's lupus nephritis, right? The clinical features of lupus nephritis would be hematuria, red cell cast and proteinuria. Remember, whenever there is a proteinuria and a new onset hypertension with lower extremity edema and elevation in creatinine, you should suspect lupus nephritis as one of the important causes. Hematologic manifestations include anemia, which is seen in more than 50% of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. And the type of anemia is often anemia of chronic disease. That's the most common type of anemia in SLE. But it can also be iron deficiency anemia. It could be Coombs positive autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It could be red cell uh, red blood cell aplasia and microangiopathy hemolytic anemia. Any of these types of anemias can be seen in SLE. Okay. The second one is thrombocytopenia. And finally, when all the counts are decreased, it is pancytopenia. Coming to the lung involvement, it is the pleuritis. That is, the involvement of pleura is the most common. It can also be in the form of pleural effusion or pneumonitis. Very rarely, usual interstitial pneumonia or diffuse alveolar damage can be a manifestation of systemic lupus erythematosus in lungs. Cardiac manifestations, had we had, as we had discussed earlier, the most common one is pericarditis and pericardial effusion. Very rarely, myocarditis and these patients have a very high risk of developing coronary artery disease. And this is one of the important manifestations, particularly these patients present with intractable headaches, which is uh, reported in more than 50% of cases. They can present with either focal or generalized seizures. Rarely, it could be in the form of aseptic meningitis or even demyelinating syndromes. And patients with SLE have a very high risk of ischemic, pro-ischemic strokes. 
when it comes to psychiatric manifestations patients can present with either depression or they can be anxious sometimes it can be a frank psychosis so that's the plethora of uh, you know clinical manifestations but then how do you diagnose uh, sle once the clinician suspects that this could be sle he or she suggests laboratory tests but remember there is no single clinical feature or a single lab abnormality which can confirm sle diagnosis that is why in the beginning itself i had told you right it is the constellation of clinical serologic and morphological changes we have talked about clinical features as of now right now let's look into the most important aspect of laboratory diagnosis which is demonstration of anti nuclear antibodies which is as you all know it's the hallmark of disease right this will be the initial test performed by the clinician if uh, he or she suspects that the patient would be having systemic lupus erythematosus and demonstration of anti nuclear antibodies is by immunofluorescence assay which is the gold standard and positive ana that is anti nuclear antibodies is seen in more than 97% of cases of sle but remember it is not specific right the specificity is only around 20% of cases because anas can be seen in other disorders as well while you are looking at you know the demonstration of ana by immunofluorescence method it is the pattern of nuclear fluorescence which suggests the type of antibody present in the patient's serum right and the patterns could be homogeneous or diffuse nuclear staining pattern it could be peripheral staining or rim pattern speckled pattern nucleolar pattern and centromeric pattern let us understand each one of these in great detail that's the homogeneous pattern look at this that's a nuclear diffusely you no know, fluorescing nuclei which is usually you know uh, indicative of antibodies to chromatin or histones and occasionally it could be due to antibodies to double stranded dna that is the homogeneous or diffuse nuclear staining pattern the second one is a rim or a peripheral staining pattern where the fluorescence you know is taken up only by the periphery of the nucleus nuclear membrane right so that is indicative of antibodies to double stranded dna and sometimes to nuclear enveloped proteins the third one is the speckled pattern where you find you know uniform or variable sized speckles one of the most commonly observed pattern in fluorescence and that's why this is the least specific pattern but then you find this pattern when the patient is having antibodies to non nuclear constituents such as you know smith antigen ribonucleoprotein and ssa and ssb reactive antigens ro and la right so the next pattern is the nucleolar pattern where you find few discrete spots of fluorescence within the nucleus corresponding to the nucleolar region it indicates that there is antibodies to rna and that's most often seen in patients with systemic sclerosis which is another autoimmune disease which i'll be discussing in my future sessions and the last one is the centromeric pattern where you find antibodies which is specific for centromeres you know it's very easily appreciable uh, appreciated in the nucleus which is dividing if it is a mitotic phase you can easily see that the centromeres are aligned in the center right that's why it, this 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 horizontal you know uh, pecks of fluorescence indicate you of the presence of centromeres that's the centromeric pattern and again this is most often seen in patients with systemic sclerosis let us summarize the patterns which you can observe one is the homogeneous pattern the rim or peripheral staining pattern that is the speckled pattern that's the nucleolar pattern and that is the centromeric pattern earlier days we used to do uh, you know uh, in vitro test for sle that is demonstration of le cell phenomenon when i was talking about pathogenesis i did mention this right when the blood is agitated the blood cells break and the nuclei are exposed right and once the nuclei are exposed the auto antibodies bind to the exposed nuclei and then there is formation of le bodies or hematoxylin bodies and these le bodies or hematoxylin bodies they are phagocytosed by the intact surrounding neutrophil and that is called as an le cell or lupus erythematosus cell this demonstration was a past test for sle this is no longer done because you know you have you know elisa test for confirmation of lupus erythematosus or demonstration of anti nuclear antibodies
So this is the classical uh, lupus erythematosus cell. That's the nucleus. Look at this. The lobes of the nucleus are pushed to the periphery by the LE body. Okay, that's the homogeneous eosinophilic material, which is also known as hematoxylin body. When it is engulfed by the intact neutrophil, it pushes the nuclear lobes to the periphery and forms a cell that's called LE cell. Now, how many of such cells you need to demonstrate. An LE cell is considered positive when you see at least four typical lupus erythematosus cells and you have to, you know, search if you don't find for at least 20 minutes. And it is found in around 50 to 80 percent of SLE patients. Positive LE cell is more specific for SLE, but it can be found in 5 percent of rheumatoid arthritis, some scleroderma patients and in some drug-induced reactions. But if you find this, it is most often suggestive of systemic lupus erythematosus. The other investigations which can be done is the routine CBC where you find anemia. Peripheral smear examination, you can find hemolytic blood picture. The total uh, white blood cell count will be reduced. It, there can be thrombocytopenia as well. The ESR and C-reactive protein will be increased, which is basically a marker of inflammation. Urine analysis is performed to look for the renal damage in the form of uh, lupus nephritis. If you see proteinuria, if you see hematuria, it indicates renal involvement, then renal biopsy is suggested to know the class of nephritis. We have talked about six classes of nephritis, right? The serum C3 and C4 levels will be low, indicating that these complement components are consumed in SLE. So now that you have uh, come to a diagnosis of SLE, what would be the disease course? As I said, this is a multi-system disease which has a variable and unpredictable course with treatment. Now, how do you treat these? It can be a multimodal treatment in the form of physical and lifestyle modifications. This treatment can be as simple as you know, administering NSAIDs or it can be administering steroids to cytotoxic drugs. But with treatment, remember, the disease follows a relapsing and remitting course over a period of years or even decades. But some patients, even without treatment, you know, they have indolent course. What would be the cause of death in these patients? The most common cause of death in these patients, in the patients of SLE, are renal failure and intercurrent infections. The renal failure, you know, that's because of lupus nephritis infections. Why, why is this infection? That is because of underlying immune dysfunction in SLE or could be because of treatment with immunosuppressive drugs where the patients will become more susceptible to development of life-threatening infections. The next important cause of death is death by coronary artery disease. Now that you have come to the end of the video, I would suggest you to click on the link below in the pinned comment as well as in the description. This is via Visdolia where you have practice questions in the form of multiple choice questions, short answer type of questions, as well as clinical scenario based questions. The best part of Visdolia is that you do get instant feedback when you go wrong. It is fun to learn. Click on the link below and enjoy learning. So that's all for today's session. In the next session, I'll come out with another interesting autoimmune disease that is rheumatoid arthritis. If you have liked this video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have anything to ask. If you find this video useful, do subscribe and don't forget to share. Thank you.